I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the MVP Show. My intention is that you listen to the stories of these MVP guests and are inspired to become an MVP and bring value to the world through your skills. If you have not checked it out already, I do a YouTube series called How to Become an MVP. The link is in the show notes. With that, let's get on with the show. Today's guest is from England. He's an ecosystem architect at ANS Group. He was first awarded as MVP in 2024, so brand new. He's a low-code architect with 15 years' experience across VBA, SQL Server, SharePoint, M365 Services, and Power Platform. You can find links to his bio in, and socials in the show notes for this episode. Welcome to the show, Craig. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. It's uh, Yeah, it's good to, to be on this podcast. It feels kind of weird having listened to so many of them for, you know, for what seems like for ages now and, and, and learning a lot about other people. It's uh, kind of feels surreal to be here, but thanks for inviting me. Really appreciate it. It's, it's, it's great to have you on. And somebody that's so new to the MVP program, I always like, it, you know, it's a chance to go, hey, what's what's different, what's changed, that type of thing. But before we go there, tell me a bit about food, family, fun. What do they mean to you? What's your story? What's your origin story? How did you get into this game? How did I get into this game? I came into this game of finance, actually. Um, not a direct career switcher, but when I was 18, 17, 18, um, I was out of work, so I went down to the local job centre in England. This is before like you could get online jobs. Like this is when jobs were in the backs of papers and stuff. And I went to the job centre, got these little cards, and uh, yeah, I managed to get like an office job. And I did that for eight years, nine years, of just putting invoices on systems. With the greatest respect, it's a kind of like a junior role, right? It's an entry level role. Um, and I moved down to so I was living in London. So for the the non UK listeners, if you imagine where London is. And then look at a map of England and go right down to the bottom left, which is where Cornwall is, which is where I live, so like 300 miles away. I moved down here in, yeah, 15, 16 years ago. Got the same kind of job, just put invoices on systems. And we got a new financial director and he decided to have one-to-ones with everyone. I went in with like, I want to just prove that I can do more than just key invoice numbers and values um can someone give us a shot i haven't got any bits of paper qualifications but i'd like to just have a go and i got a role like higher up doing stuff with spreadsheets like um yeah like because i was in a finance department for a hospital i spent six years doing that realized i didn't want to be an accountant but i loved automation i love code um I did some pretty cool stuff i just kind of then gravitated into different tech from there really so then went from that to access um then that into sql server and like business intelligence so looking at a lot of integration with sharepoint on-prem and ssrs reporting and it's old school performance point cubes that you should be able to get in sharepoint they were cool i like them um and then from that into sharepoint designer and infopath and then into power platform um so i've been with the power platform since 2016 so i think that's pretty much on launch i think um and yeah, I've loved it ever since. So yeah, a bit of a, not necessarily a direct quit career switcher and not a conscious effort to go and change careers, but I just sort of seem to have, yeah, gravitated to an area which I absolutely love. So yeah, that's me professionally. Um, food wise, if it's, if it's there to eat, I'll probably eat it to be fair. Um, I'm not fussy. I like a pizza. I like a curry. Um, I've got a very sweet tooth as my waistline will um a testament to that um especially as you get older it seems to be quite harder to kind of shift off um but i do like a chocolate bar i do like a beer um pretty standard stuff really i like my sport i got um outside of work i've got a, a wife and a daughter she's eight years old so um yeah just 
general stuff, I think, really. I don't think I do anything or I'm into anything kind of too out there and mad or like socialising. I like my family. And I know the listeners won't be able to see this, but now you can see that I've got a massive pile of Lego behind me. Um, and people that have been on camera with me or know me quite well know that I really enjoy my big Lego sets and I enjoy building Lego with my daughter in my spare time as well. So, uh, yeah, a huge passion is, is the Lego. <laughs> so you're still in the Cornwall area? I am, yeah. It's a lovely part of England. It's a bit cut off to some extent. Like, you know, it feels like we only got electricity last week. It kind of, you know, I think a lot of the people sort of get down to Bristol and then think that's where the country stops. Isn't it? There's this, this massive long stretch that carries on afterwards. I mean, I'm three hours from Bristol and I'm not even at the tail end of Cornwall. But it's a really safe place to bring up my daughter. It's lovely. Um, so much got, history down there, right? Oh, it's amazing. Like, if you go around through all the, um, like the engine houses, yeah, yeah. Um, Pole dark is what comes to mind when uh, yeah, you know, I think yeah. Of agent, lots right? of people go out and um, who's that? Oh, the, the famous doctor on TV. I can't remember his name. Is that's all filmed down here as well. There's loads of stuff are going in Cornwall. Um, you don't necessarily get like the big bands that come through on a tour. They don't come down here and like those big events or the big clubs and the big bars and whatever else. And the, we haven't got a Nando's down here. Like that's how kind of <laughs> cut off we are. That's really. Have, have you have you been to the Robin Crab Shack in in Cornwall? No. Oh, you got to go there. Right, I'm getting that. You, you get a big crab, you know, uh, all the different rums that, that they have in there. Ooh, it's just, I do it's like on the rum. water, it's on the waterfront there. I, you know, I love Cornwall. Yeah, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. And I mean, I, I list off a load of things that it hasn't got, but there's a lot of things it has got that other places in, in the country haven't got. I've got three beaches within five minutes drive. Um, and it's just, so, it's cheap and easy entertainment for the little one. Just go down there, skim stones, climb on rocks, rock pool in, muck about, and it's just fresh air. The air is so clean around here because it's all coming off the sea. Uh, it's all unpolluted, and it's just yes, yeah, it's, it's just a very chilled part of the part of the country. I think I'd lived in the rat race. I lived in London for many years. Um, some days I miss the hustle and bustle, and I come, I go up there every now and then to see family. But then when I come back, I'm just like. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm home. That's better. <laughs> it's nice. It's a lovely part of the country. Lovely part. I see that you have a lot to do with ecosystems and your ecosystem architect at ANS. Um, tell us, what are your thoughts around ecosystems? How do you explain it to people? How do I explain it to people? Um, the best way I explain it to people, and it seems to resonate, which is great, is around enabling others to do things, not doing it yourself. That's the kind of, I think, the high-level concept. And it resonates a lot with me because knowingly or otherwise, I've done that for many years. Like, I've always enjoyed showing other people how to do things, um, helping them to kind of like upskill based on what I've learned. Um, and I think that concept that Chris and Jason, uh, previous guests of yourselves on the podcast, have brought to where we work about, it's not just about building an app and building a flow for someone. Um, certainly not from a low-code perspective. It's about enabling a whole workforce to embrace these tools because that, at the end of the day, is what they're they're built to be doing. It's like it's almost like we've recreated that bottleneck we used to have with ProCode internally. Like you had this ProCode team that would build stuff and everything went into them and you'd then moan. It was like, well, we haven't got enough people and they, 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 they need to kind of hurry up and, and build these, these ProCode solutions. So then LoCode comes in. Oh well, we can. This is designed for everyone in the business to go and build stuff. Your admin assistants, your your finance clerks, whatever, go and build your own stuff. And we've created this same problem of now we've got a power platform team, and they deal with all of the internal automations, and no one else does. And I just love the whole thought of like actually no, enable your whole ecosystem to go and build this stuff because everyone deserves the feeling that I've got when I go and build something really cool that does a, a good job at you know improving a process i get a real buzz out of that i want you to have that feeling i want everyone else to have that feeling they shouldn't have to have developer at the end of their name or architect um so that's my wider thing is what it means to me um and then it's all the building blocks that go under that or to enable a whole ecosystem you've got to think about your governance which is my stronger area my the technical side of power platform governance that's where i sit i know change management is a huge factor in that as well something I'm not so hot on but want to be better at. Um, there's loads of facets in there that can enable people's ecosystems to go and be autonomous. And I love that thought. It's wicked. 
Um, and that's why I really enjoy my role with, with ANS because it's not just about building apps for the people, although we do that. And I still enjoy building an app every now and then. Don't get me wrong. I still like getting my hands dirty, but evangelizing about the, the capabilities and helping others to build stuff, like that's really cool. I and mean, you don't see a lot of people doing that, which is, I guess, makes what we do a little bit more unique, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's, that, that's a, I like what you said there about enabling other people you know, to build solutions um, rather than just building it for them. And and you're so right about the pro code uh, area where that became a, a blocker for really the backlog gets so long, right? Where if you, and, and the same thing is then happening in low code and it's better to enable people so they can build their own solutions. Tell me, tell me about, um, you've recently become an MVP just this year and I'm keen to know, what was that process for you? Tell me about your journey to MVP. If you're looking for a structured way to enhance your career in Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform, this is for you. Enrollment for the 90 Day Mentoring Challenge, April to June cohort, are now open. I discovered MSCRM in 2003 and it changed the course of my life. My career in Dynamics 365 and the Power Platform has taken me all over the world and the opportunities for people to build a career in the space today are better than ever. The 90-Day Mentoring Challenge will help you chart a path to capitalize on these opportunities and build the skills for greatness. Find out more at ako.nz365guy.com. For the first time, I'm limiting space on this cohort for a more intimate experience. So if you want to be part of it, don't wait. Enrollment will close on the 25th of March. Podcast listeners can use the code PODCAST for a 10% discount at checkout. funny i was talking to someone else about this recently actually back in so i'll start back in like 2017 so not long after the power platform came out we hadn't embraced it where i was straight away um we were still using infopath and sharepoint designer please do not crucify me for that one and i was we were trying to use the sharepoint rest api to automate the creation of sharepoint sites because that was a very common request at the time and um we we're trying to work something out with this api so i did a bit of googling I found an article from an MVP whose name I can't remember. And back then, I think I was a little bit clueless about what an MVP was. Like I saw this badge and I saw this status. Oh, wow, I want to be one of those. Like They must know everything. Like, they must, like, I just put them on pedestals. Fast forwarding now to what eight years down the line, seven years, eight years. Now I fully understand what an MVP is and what's involved. It wasn't necessarily a goal of mine the last year or two to become an MVP. It's just sort of happened organically just from me getting some confidence out of somewhere to go and share what I know to a wider audience. And I I said earlier that I've always enjoyed training and helping others, but I've always kind of kept that to the people I work with, like my my teams, my immediate people. Like Maybe that's a comfort thing. I don't know. Um, And someone said to me last year, it's like, well, all you're going to do is just go and do that. but to a wider audience it's like oh yeah that's a good point um so yeah i started my blog last year yeah may last year without any intentions of being mvp so all those thoughts from 2017 is like yeah they're completely gone like because I, I i wasn't thinking about it all for wrong reasons it's like you know what i'm going to start a blog i've wanted to do a blog for years i've always enjoyed using other people's blogs to help me do stuff i thought i'd love i've always wanted to do that so i just started um and I'm flattered by the reception it's got. But wow, like, forget the awards. The awards are wicked, right? Um, I'm very flattered and honoured and proud to be an MVP, but I prefer all the community stuff that I've got out of it. I've made new friends, new connections, new possibilities that wouldn't have been possible had I not have just spent, made more out of my, my own personal time rather than just sitting in front of Netflix, which is still cool, right? You know, but actually doing something a bit more productive in my evenings rather than just vegging and, you know, moaning and looking at my phone and actually, you know, doing some fun stuff, which I enjoy as well. I enjoy my blog. Um, cause I, with the ecosystem stuff, I don't necessarily get to build stuff anymore cause I'm helping other people, but in my spare time, I can still muck about with code and I haven't got a sprint deadline to kind of worry about or, you know, <laughs> haven't got any, yeah, I haven't got any of those kind of pressures. So, it's been a wonderful journey this last year and a half. Um, I went for a bit of a rocky patch a couple of years ago for a few personal things. So I've been kind of down and I've had a couple of people that have sort of 
lifted me back up to a really good spot and you realize what this community stuff is all about it's not just about you know sharing knowledge it's about helping each other and that's not just with the tech it's with you know people to try and achieve you know for the potential to try and achieve something greater than what they think they're capable of um so i'm all about paying that forward now as much as the technical stuff so it's been a wonderful journey but it's just kind of the start of it really like and i said to you before we came on air it's like I've only been an MVP a month. It doesn't feel, it's not sunk in yet. It feels kind of weird, but I know maybe it will when the trophy's sitting behind me because I know you get that nice little glass trophy. Maybe it will sink in then when that comes through the post. But up until that point, it just, yeah, it just feels a bit surreal. But yeah, it feels amazing. It feels wicked. So tell me about technically, how did it happen? Who who nominated you? Who guided you? Who coached you um, to MVP? Um, well, the person who nominated me is asked to obviously rename Nameless, so I will respect that. Um, but I had, I mean, many people listening will know Chris Huntingford. Um, I'm lucky enough that I now work with him, and I think he started at ANS along with Jason Earnshaw at the right time when I was probably at that lowest point that I've been in the last couple of years from a professional and a personal point of view. And I think the pair of them, Again, forget necessarily like mentoring me towards MVP, but just mentoring me to be more confident and to just give me the lift that I needed to say, hey, no, I am pretty good at what I do and I do know some stuff and go out there and show people kind of thing. Um, those two especially have been, I'll be forever grateful for those two. Um, but there's a few other people as well. Lewis Baber, who I'm sure, you know, he's not long been out of school the guy is an absolute machine. He's brilliant. Um, and I joked with him a while ago. It's like, genuinely, I'm old enough to be his father, um, which is kind of weird. And here there's this young man blossoming in and he's just empowering these people around him, like people twice his age, like me. And I was like, what? what? I was chatting to Lewis about blogging in March, April last year, what can I blog about? Who's going to listen to what I'm going to say? And he just came out with so many cool lines about, there's always someone in the room that's going to learn. I remember that. And I gave Lewis a topic and within like a minute, he'd written down like seven, eight, nine art blog article ideas. It's like, wow, this this is amazing. So to have those three people around me, yeah, I've been very lucky. I don't think a lot of people necessarily get the opportunity that I've had to be mentored and uplifted by three very powerful people but you know you, you've got to make the most of these things when they happen right yeah you just mentioned you know lewis you know had a topic five or six articles you've been blogging for a while a lot of people go how do you come up with content to be able to blog how do you and what is your blogging process I, I, and i want you to to kind of break it down for me from uh how do you make sure you've always got a big bag of topics to, to jump onto and then what is your process um that you go through ultimately to publishing a post um idea it's, wise, it's, it might be simple to you right but to a lot of people they want those practical steps what are the actual steps you go through my brain doesn't sleep um that's the first that's the first important step because um last year i was diagnosed with adhd and it makes a lot of sense because my brain does not stop firing i wake up at random points in the in three o'clock in the morning and go oh that might be a good idea for a blog and i write it down on my phone and i go back to sleep so i, I constantly have like this big pool of ideas on my phone just random stuff and i've probably duplicated loads of them so sometimes i'll just sort of go through that list and go make some sense out of it of like oh what ideas might be good and can i chain a series out of them so rather than just looking at one isolated post, much like people might just look at a single app, look at the wider picture and go, well, I've got this one blog post, but in order to do this blog post, I might need to blog about that first. And in order to blog about that first, I might need to do blog at this first. And then I'll start breaking it down into bite-sized chunks. And then all of a sudden I've got like five, six, seven articles. Cool. Well, there's, there's like my content for the next six weeks. So like, I haven't got to rush around thinking, oh, what am I going to post this week? Like, I've kind of got an idea of like six to eight weeks, every moving goal, I have an idea of what I'm blogging about in what order. So that's the first part. Getting like, looking ahead, not just looking at one, but looking, yeah, three, four, five, six posts in advance. Then depends on the topic. It probably be something technical, like it's a bit of code or a new feature. 
So I'll, I've got my own tenant, so I'll go and play around in there because um, I don't want to regurgitate the articles of Microsoft because you can go and look at those. So why wouldn't you? Um, but I want to look at my experiences with that. So I'm going to go, I'm going to click around. I'm going to talk about the, bl- the bugs that I find or some little quirks that some other people are aware of them and just my experiences, my findings. So that's, I tend to have a lot of time on my own tenant just playing around with stuff. Um, and then trying to inject my experience into it. I think that was the, the key thing I wanted to do with my blog was just not make it like every other blog. And I don't mean that in a detrimental way to anyone, but a lot of it's very sort of practical business-like. So it's like, well, can I put a bit different spins on things? So what experiences have I got that are unique? Well, I built a solution with my wife last year for her self-employed business. I haven't seen anyone blog about that before. I'm still covering the same topic. So we're still talking about environment variables, solutions, application lifecycle management, very common themes. So if people out there are sitting, well, you know, people have already blogged about them things. It's like, yeah, I know, but I'm going to blog about them, but with my experience and my context, which is going to be different to yours and different to everyone else's. So, yeah, the process is just, yeah, planning. Always important to plan. I've got bits of notes and paper, like, knocking around in my desk in all kinds of weird places. If my wife moves them, I get really angry because I know what every bit of paper does and what every bit of paper means. And then I'm very lucky. I've got a good balance at home. So I spend like an hour in the evenings like drafting some stuff up during the week just to kind of get a rough flow of how, what, 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 what's my structure of my post, what sections are going to go first, second and third, what's my beginning, middle and end of my story. And then as I kind of work through the week, I'll just sort of go, mm, that doesn't feel quite right, change a few bits around. And then when it gets to Sunday afternoon, that's when I kind of like sit down, stick some tunes on, hyper-focus, and then kind of like finish my article. Um, and then it's ready to go on Tuesday. I always leave myself a day. I don't want to finish on Sunday and post on a Monday. I like to just decompress, take a day, come back to it on a Monday evening. So before I came on air this evening, uh, to, this is a Monday for me, I've read the reread the post that's going out tomorrow morning with fresh eyes to make sure that there's no spelling mistakes and it still flows well and I've not missed anything. Um, I always like to give myself a day in between finishing the article and posting it at least just so I can kind of just send to check it. So that's my process. Think of ideas, plan ahead and just take your time. Um, it's worked for me. <laughs> it might not work for others, but it works for me. And most importantly, I enjoy it. That's I look forward to coming online after the little ones in bed and just mucking about with some power effects for an hour and a half. Like I'm like a kid in a sweet shop. It's wicked. <laughs> <laughs> Final question. Um, for those listening that are aspiring to become MVPs themselves, what would you advise them? I'd advise the same thing that the person in 2017 said to me when I said, oh, I want to be an MVP. He said, if you want to be an MVP, don't try and become an MVP. And I've heard that advice given to others a lot. And by that, I mean, it's all well and good having like this status and this badge, but the main goal of being an MVP is sharing your knowledge, sharing what you know, helping other people. Do that with passion, with verve, with excitement, and all the other accolades and the awards, whether it's an MVP or a forum super user or whatever. That will all come naturally, I think. Helping other people, that's that's what it's all about. Helping people in the community to learn these tools, to be better with them to learn from your mistakes. I'm quite open to the mistakes I've made. I, I engage regularly with clients saying, yeah, here's my mess up. So you don't have to do them. Just helping other people. I think that's, that's, if you want to become an MVP, just start there. Just try and share what you know. And as Lewis said to me, there's always one person in the room that's going to learn, right? So just keep doing that and keep momentum with it. And eventually, it's a bit like employee of the month, I say. And I said this on another podcast recently. Like, if you rock up to work and you do your hours and you work hard and you're consistent, the the bonuses and the awards and promotions, they'll come over time. If you try too hard to get them, you're not going to get them, you know, because you, you people can spot a try hard too hard. You know, oh, no, he's not doing this, he's not doing that. It's the same thing for the community stuff. If you rock up, show, you know, add value, help people, over time, all the other good stuff will come. So that would be my advice, really. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If you like the show and want to be a supporter, 
check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash nz365guide. Thanks again and see you next time. Before you go, a quick reminder that the 90 Day Mentoring Challenge kicks off on the 1st of April. Every cohort, I hear people say that surely this group has been the best one ever. The true magic of the 90 Day Mentoring Challenge is the connections formed between a group of people who are committed to learning with and from each other. Will you be part of the best cohort yet? Use the code PODCAST for 10% off at checkout. Visit ako.nz365guy.com to see a detailed curriculum and hear what past participants have to say about the challenge. I can't wait to help you discover the unique value you bring to the community and just how far you can take your career.